But uh, what I want us to do at, at, at the outset is to turn directly to the, to the, BART, to the BART piece. And I would just like to take a few minutes um, now to use this essay as a way of um, kind of constructing uh, um, a narrative framework for the work that we're doing together this semester. And, um, and, to, and to kind of look at this, at this gem as um, a, um, as a, as a, in some ways, sure, it's, it's biased, it's written through a perspective of one of Protestant liberalism's most um, relentless critics. It, it, yeah, at the same time, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's charitable, uh, it's an exceedingly charitable piece as well. And I think that sense of generosity, interpretive generosity that you find in this essay is often uh, lost um, um, by focusing on some of the just kind of really, you know, uh, pithy lines um, that sort of have kind of like a, a kind of a, 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 a tweet, you know, a kind of a Twitter kind of urgency about them, such as that on the top of page 19, when, you know, after this sort of clarifying opening passage, Theology, however, went overboard insofar as confrontation with the con contemporary age was its decisive and primary concern. And, um, and then such lines as um, um, uh, the, the theologians of the, of the 19th century, while trying so hard to um, develop some kind of um, apologetics of the Christian faith that um, could be um, located within, you know, the discourse of the humanities or within some of the prevailing um, intellectual and cultural fashions. Um, so, so, so hard, in fact, that that the essential uh, re report of, of, the, of, of the Christian gospel and the doctrine of revelation and the like um, were, were often lost. Um, Bart says that there's, there's something, there's some kind of silent insecurity and anxiety that is, 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 is that, that is um, enabling um, or that is um, inspiring this kind of, I don't know, bad faith and the sufficiency of the Christian faith's own inner resources and logic. So let's start with the beginning though. Um, theology in the very literal sense means the science and doctrine of God. Okay, that's good. A very precise definition of the Christian endeavor in this respect would really require the more complex term uh, uh, the, anthropo the anthropology for an abstract doctrine of God has no place in the Christian realm, only a doctrine of God and of man, of God and of humankind, a doctrine of the commerce and communion between God and humankind. Um, elsewhere um, and earlier in this large multi-volume, um, is it 13 volumes, 13, 14, uh, volume Church Dogmatics that Bart produced, he described uh, Christian theology as a um, uh, second order um, um, reflection on the church's distinctive speech and practices. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's kind of what he's moving here to here as well. Christian theology or Christian dogmatics as a second order reflection on the church's um, distinctive speech and practices that, that uh, unlike Lionel Niebuhr, who largely lacks any kind of ecclesiology, if you will, any kind of a, a, a doctrine of the church uh, in his theological system, even though he's, he's, a very, he's very much of a, an active and faithful churchman, and he preaches, and, you know, he's, 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 he's um, deeply immersed in um, the ecclesial world of you know, American Protestantism in the in early and mid 20th century. 
Um, for Bonhoeffer, uh, theology is first and foremost uh, a servant of the church. Evangelical means informed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the word evangelical, uh, we could spend, you know, the rest of the, of, our, uh, of the day talking about its uses and misuses in the current, you know, political scene. Um, but evangelical in its etymological sense um, means simply and forthrightly um, good tidings, glad tidings, good news, um, and, um, and, and clusters around various ways of, you know, articulating this, uh, this, this, the story of, 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 of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus to be one in which um, light appears in the darkness, word becomes uh, flesh, dwells among us, um, um, in, in the barrier, the, the, the walls of you know, division between male and female, slave and free, you know, um, rich and poor, slave and master have been abolished in this um, uh, event of, you know, of, 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 of the atoning death of Jesus Christ, etc. cetera. Um, evangelical theology means first and foremost informed by the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And as you see, one of his kind of critiques and I, I think laments of the, um, of the, what he calls evangelical theology in the 19th century is that it, um, it, it, it drifted away from that primary mission of, as, Bonhoeff, as, Bart, as Bart says somewhere in the, in the dogmatics, um, preaching of repentance and forgiveness to the nations. And so this is, you know, sort of a, this is an unapologetic Christian theology that Bart proffers and Niebuhr himself um, more than once referred to his own kind of theological method and indeed his theological kind of uh, vocation as one of doing apologetics. Now in apologetics, he didn't mean apologetics in the sense in which it's some, some, sometimes used um, popularly, um, again, in, in sometimes in evangelical circles to, um, um, to be um, arguments that, that, that marshal uh, evidence historical or, or, rash, or, or, or philosophical evidence to uh, prove or to um, um, uh, bring um, um, credibility to the true claims of the Christian faith. Apologetics, you know, like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity is the sort of a classic work of apologetics as um, are more kind of um, popular books. Um, one by Josh McDowell, who you may have heard of, called Evidence That Demand Demands a Verdict, which I think has sold like three million copies and still in print. Um, and then more sort of um, um, more, um, I, I guess, in a, in a more sort of in a, in a kind of a public sort of theology context, uh, Tim, Kel uh, Tim Keller is a pastor of a Presbyterian Church in New York called Redeemer Press wrote a book some years ago called um, the Re I think it's called the Reason of Faith, which is basically um, a kind of summary of Reformed Christian apologetics. But this is, uh, um, but Niebuhr thought of when he called his work apologetics, he did not mean apologetics in that sense. He meant um, um, apologetics in the sense of accepting the you know Enlightenment uh, critique of the of many aspects of the Christian religion, uh, its critique of, of miracles, its you know kind of embrace of historical critical um, interpretation of, of the scripture, its you know demurral on you know sort of the identity of, of, of Jesus Christ and, and, and the like. Uh, apologetics for him meant finding ways to make the Christian um, kind of linguistic, ethical system credible or useful or applicable in the modern era. Uh, Bart, um, um, look, he's, you know, he, 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 he in some way, he, he, he praises the, the, the theologians of the 19th century um, who, who are kind of 
collectively in, engaged in this sort of work of developing um, uh, a system or systems of Christian apologetics for their courage and for their honesty and for their, their willingness to engage uh, intellectual um, life and to um, put themselves in the midst of the critical you know, debates of, of the era, but um, rejects any uh, insinuation that Christian theology needs a prolegomena grounded in uh, a ph philosophical um, or anthropological or epistemological or whatever, any kind of apologetics. Christian, um, uh, Christian, uh, the Christian faith is nourished, the Christian theology, Christian doctrine is nourished, self-nourished by the, uh, what Hans Frey, a great theologian at Yale, you know, um, and Abartian once, you know, referred to as sort of the, the inner logic and the in, inner sense of, of, um, of, of revelation. So evangelical theology also simply means, by the way, Protestant theology. Uh, many of you know that, that in uh, Germany, um, the universities uh, are, uh, the theological faculties in the, in the universities uh, are not as they're configured here in the United States, where you have a department of religious studies, at least in public and kind of major research universities, you have a department of religious studies um, within which, you know, you, we teach five major religious traditions and do all, all, all sorts of other cool things. Um, there are, you know, um, well, n now there are institutes of, of Buddhist studies and Islam and the like, but in, 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 um, uh, in this era that Bart is reflecting on, indeed, in his own era, there are really only two faculties. There's the Catholic faculty and the Protestant faculty. The Catholic faculty is just the Catholische Theologie, and then you've got the Protestant faculty is the Evangelische Theologie. So in some ways, even, uh, Evangelisch is just simply Protestant. So that's, there's that aspect as well that it's not to, not to be forgotten. Anyway, evangelical theology, according to this definition, did exist in the 19th century um, as part of the panorama of this era, along with much natural science and technology, history and politics, literature, art and philosophy, and along with Roman Catholic theology, this evangelical theology was present. My task here is to describe it briefly. I shall confine myself to the German speaking world this is justified in that 19th century German theology was the signpost for theological endeavor. I don't think uh, elsewhere. This preeminent, preeminence may not last indefinitely. I, I, would, I would argue that in fact, the, um, the uh, emergence of, um, a, of, a, of a kind of a, of a theological um, um, a, a theological narrative um, in the 19th century in Germany remains still a kind of regulative interpretive framework for theological studies in certainly the European Anglo-American world, but, but, uh, but, but in, um, in Latin America, South America uh, as well. And, and, and so far as is there continues to be this, this kind of reciprocity between um, the theological faculties in Western Europe and those in South America and Latin America. Um, um, and that what we have here, another way of, of talking about this body of um, theological writing that Bart refers to as um, as uh, Protestant theology in the 19th century. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can, for our own kind of rhetorical purposes, when we're referring, you know, when we're referring to um, Bart's critical kind of moves in this essay, it may be easier just to refer to the, the interlocutor in that exchange as the Protestant tradition or the or Protestant theology in the, in the 19th century. And then insofar as Bart is wanting to offer a corrective of that and to restore uh, the primacy of the Christian gospel as a self 
sufficient source for the work of Christian dogmatics, we might speak of that as evangelical, but even doing that, we have to be careful. Um, more, I would say more, the more precise description of this tradition that Bart is offering up, um, um, that, that Bart is, is wanting to revisit um, with both, you know, a charitable, but, but finally, you know, a kind of critical, uh, you know, almost kind of a, a, a heartbreaking, uh, maybe that's a little too strong, um, uh, analysis is simply this, the Protestant liberal tradition. That's what he's talking about here. What he's, what he's uh, excavating is a, a body of discourse that really does define Protestant liberalism as it's used by every figure that we'll encounter the semester and as it should be used um, um, uh, within in any intelligent conversation about intellectual history. So the 19th century is behind us. So also is the evangelical theology of that century. And by the way, when, when I use the word liberal here, this is not, a, 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 in any case, a judgment call. It's, it's not to sort of, you know, I mean, liberal in some circles has, you know, it's, it's just become um, um, such a, as I said, such an absurdly um, uh, um, mean, uh, overused and meaningless term. But when we think of liberal theological tra tradition, we're thinking um, of, of, of what Bart is showing us here of a, of a theological methodology that um, emerges from the work of Immanuel Kant, you know, the, the great kind of philosophical theologian who um, wrote the you know, critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, the critique of judgment, and um, who uh, inaugurated what you know many philosophers and theologians and interpreters of intellectual history um, um, describe as you know a kind of fundamental um, shift in uh, um, the, the the idea of, of mind and epistemological. Um, a knowledge and the shaping of um, um, the human, uh, the, the, the creative um, intellectual shaping of, of the world, and in particular of the ideas of, of God, world, and self. And so the, the, the particular kind of methodology that is at play in the Protestant liberal um, tradition that, that Bart will um, on, on you know, he, he will sort of explicate for us is um, is is methodologically defined by um, a um, by a, Christ, a, a, a a way of doing Christian theology that seeks first and foremost to understand the idea of God on the basis of some mode or modulation of human experience. May I repeat that? Um, that, sorry, uh, that the, um, that the, that the, that the, that the, that the Protestant liberal tradition as described by Bart, um, and again, as, um, as a description, not as a critical judgment is, defined methodologically as a way of thinking about Christian faith that is based first and foremost on, um, on uh, uh, um, understanding, um, what did I say? First and foremost on um, um, explicating the idea of God, understanding the idea of God on the basis of some mode or modulation of human experience. Bart um, will time and again remind us that Christian theology must be based first and foremost on, I mean, to put it in its most simple terms, revelation. <laughs> um, the, the Christian theology must be based first and foremost on its own um, self uh, nourishing sources, um, which um, 
that Vatican II described, and Bart wouldn't disagree with this, he had very interesting um, and generative uh, ongoing dialogues with uh, Catholic theologians, particularly Jesuit theologians, particularly the Jesuit Eric Chavara and um, um, Hans Urs from Balthazar. Um, wonderful, wonderful conversations about you know, the, the uh, conflicts between um, or disagreements between Bonhoeffer's understanding, uh, critique of natural theology and the Catholic tradition's defense of natural theology. But in any case, Vatican II will describe revelation you know, as a twofold deposit um, of God's um, self um, identity, identification, and twofold deposit in, in scripture uh, and revelation and, um, and, and tradition, or in scripture and tradition. And, 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 and so, um, I mean, Bart would, would say uh, Christian theology is first and foremost, you know, an explication of God's self revelation of God's self in Jesus Christ and in scripture. Um, so, um, so let's, let's, let's continue, if you will, um, um, plowing, uh, plowing through here. Um, Mm -mm -mm. Let us begin, this is now the bottom of middle page 12. Let us begin with some summary remarks about the history of evangelical theology in the 19th century. There's hardly any doubt that the distinctive beginnings of 19th century theology coincide with the publication of uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher's book on religion, speeches to its cultured despisers in 1799. Is, is there, is, am I, Correct. Is there a course being taught right now on Schleiermacher? Yes. Well, yeah. Yes? Yes. <laughs> is, is, what, who's teaching it? Is it is Paul Jones teaching it? Yes, Paul Jones is teaching that. Is it is it is it a seminar on Schleiermacher? Is it sure Schleiermacher and Hegel or Schleiermacher and somebody else? It is Schleiermacher and Tillich. Schleiermacher and, and Tillich. Yes. So Larry, Larry Bouchard is teaching that? Yes, yeah, it's both Paul and Larry. Ah, I mean, because I think at some point in the summer, I saw that, so Paul would be teaching like a course on Schleimacher and Bart maybe, or Schleimacher and Hegel, and then Larry was gonna be teaching something on Tillich and I don't know, maybe Schleimacher. I mean, it's one of those things where you, we just send in our, our course descriptions and then they get two people like, teaching the same. So it looks like they combine forces, right? Okay, that makes sense. Um, and are you, have you read on religion yet? Are you reading that? Yes, I did. We just read it last week. Oh, yeah, oh it's such a beautiful book. Um, and if, um, if Schleiermacher had continued to write like a romantic poet instead of like a systematic theologian as he did when he turned to his dogmatics. Um, the world would be a better place. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true, um, but it's a beautiful, uh, and I mean, just like linguistically um, um, stunning a treatise um, um, of, about the, the kind of, um, essential genius, I mean, genius, they were, everybody was really sort of um, uh, um, jonesing over, over the term genius in, um, in the 19th century, and that turned out to be a really bad move for lots of reasons. But nonetheless, the essential um, uh, kind of distinctiveness of, um, of, of religion and why its cultured despisers, you know, the I don't know, the Chris Hitchens and the A Andrew Dawkins and the Bill Mars of the world um, of the 19th century, uh, who, by the way, were a lot more um, um, persuasive um, um, than 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 those than those three. Um, I mean, you can think um, of of the Schleimacher wasn't writing to. Um, to what, my to what my colleague Alan McGill in the history department refers to as the prophets of extremity, uh, namely uh, Nietzsche, uh, uh, Freud, and Marx. Um, Schleimacher is wanting to, 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 um, to show and to argue against Christianity's cultured despisers, those you know, philosophers, intellectuals, 
who think that religious uh, experience or language offers any resource uh, or, or any, in any way enriches um, um, the human uh, condition and uh, or, or promotes in any way, form or fashion, human flourishing, um, that uh, religion does have these effective, aesthetic, emotive um, uh, qualities that um, that the other the other discourses and disciplines uh, uh, need are uh, are could use as um, as generative supplements of, of of their of their own task. So anyway, um, that's the book that you know Bart kind of esteems as the, the seminal text of this period, whoever wishes to know and to understand this theology must read this little book with great care, though it is by no means easily digested. It clearly should, I think it is, like, read the second speech, it's the Viabethan speeches, and like you can just like walk around grounds with like a flashlight or something, or build a camp, out of camp campfire, you know, you can really open up uh, on religion to any passage in those first three speeches and find, you know, a, a gorgeous uh, and moving um, kind of um, love song <laughs> to, you know, religion as a sense and taste of the infinite and of the way in which there, the, the, there is within every human being this religious is kind of religious a priori, it's kind of essential um, religious kind of you know spark or 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 um, or, um, or, or, or seed or, or capacity, um, and um, and why it's important to kind of nourish and you know enrich that. Anyway, um, the course of the history of the 19th century is fairly obvious from there on. Um, so it's interesting, he sees that book as like, okay, so the way the categories were kind of reconceptualized here are a good glimpse into how this 19th century kind of Protestant liberal tradition emerged. In its understanding of Christian man, of the Christian person, this theology was first animated by Herder and the Romantics as well as by the, the, the religious and national awakening of the Napoleonic era. Many of the figures, by the way, that Bart mentions here, not, not Herod and the Romantics, but um, you know, there are several lists of some theologians. Um, if you look over on page 16, um, when he's sort of um, offering a yet another list of, of, of this, uh, that, that comprises this canon you know, of the Protestant liberal tradition, he will say one must speak with equal reverence of the human and scientific attitude of many, if not all of the representatives of this, of this theology. And then he says from Schleiermacher and his melancholy friend, De Vetta in Basel down to Richard or Richard Ruta, Isaac August Dörner, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, Hoffman and Frank of Erlangen, Alexander Schweitzer, uh, Emmanuel Ellos, Emmanuel Bieter, Biedermann in Zurich, to Martin Kaler, Ludwig Immels, Adolf von Harnack, Wilhelm Herm. I mean, these guys, nobody knows who these people are. I mean, these people are forgotten with the exception of, of Har Harnack and, and, and maybe Bauer. And, and of course, um, um, well, I mean, Martin Kaler will pop up occasionally. So don't worry if you're like, who, who are these people? Like there, a lot of these people just kind of become um, footnotes, you know, in the, uh, in, in the uh, in the in the story of of uh, modern theology, Hermann Ludemann was driven from Holstein and went to Bern. There is there was a point here that I saw um, the, uh, just last night um, that I just I was curious. I I um, uh, when again he's sort of um, offering another list of um, of these figures who comprise this. Uh, this is, you know, all, all male, um, all Germanic canon of Protestant theology of the 19th century. When he refers to, um, uh, to Goethe's critique of, um, critique of, of, uh, of 
Schleiermacher, if I'm not mistaken, that Goethe, um, did you see that? Um, and I don't know why, it's just really neither here nor there, but it jumped out at me because I don't, I don't, I've never heard, I've never, I've, I've never read this essay a million times and I just never quite um, paused at that passage. Does anyone see that where the name Goethe appears here? Um, I mean, this really is kind of getting deep in the weeds of some of the, you know, historical esoterica, but um, but now I'm now I can't find it. Does so anybody have like a search thing? On, are you looking at your laptop? Just it's, find the name Gert. It's on page seven of the PDF we have. It's about halfway through that. Um, oh, it's on page seven. So what what is the what's a um, what would the opening sentence of that particular paragraph be? Uh, it's first, were men prepared to take such lessons from the theologians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so if we, yeah, so, uh, thank you. Can we ju could you just read that passage for a minute? And don't worry if you stumble over Lutz, Zebek, Dilte, Wiccan. Just, can you just re read that paragraph uh, all the way through? Sure, that, the one that starts with that sentence. Okay. Yes. Um, first, were men prepared to take such lessons from the theologians? Did they permit having their worldviews supplemented? Were they sensitive to man's openness towards religion and the Christian faith and desirous to make any use of it? The revelation theology of Schelling during these latter years should not be forgotten at this point. And we must not overlook the later philosophers like Lutzen, Siebeck, Dilthe, and Yukon actively shared in their own way the work of the theologians. But it was a bad omen that Goethe, in whose name we're gathered here, either ignored or viewed with displeasure of what was happening. He disliked Schleiermacher's speeches quite apart from their romantic garb. The same can be said of Hegel, the other great master of the century. The efforts of Schleiermacher and his successors did not acquire any significance for the broad mass of the culture to whom Schleiermacher had addressed himself so impressively with his proof of the roots of religion in the structure of man's spiritual life. The thinking of the awakening labor class of the 19th century was even less influenced. The gratitude showered upon the theologians by the groups they addressed was not really encouraging. If this does not necessarily speak against the excellency of what these philosopher theologians did, it is yet quite serious matter when compared with the explicit intention of their work. Yeah, it's a really that's a really important passage. I mean, what what's problematic um, in this methodology of, of liberal of Protestant liberal uh, theological thought, according to Bart here, is that it um, it begins um, by Putting um, uh, on its uh, putting itself in um, the position of uh, needing to justify um, or to make um, credible vis-a-vis -vis, you know contemporary intellectual, cultural, philosophical trends the distinctive language and practices of the Christian gospel. So uh, most um, familiarly, we see this um, happen in the way that theologians uh, use philosophy. Uh, um, Bart was criticized often by Reinhold Niebuhr um, for being a kind of you know, like you know, kind of closeted fundamentalist Christian um, or, um, um, or for trading on uh, categories of theological speech that um, were made, um, um, that, that, were, that were brought, um, or that were subjected to the great critiques of the Enlightenment period and shown to be uh, unreliable or, um, or mythological uh, as truth claims about the real objectivity of God, right? You know, that, um, 
um, any any modern person, you know, who turns on um, a light switch, and this is some something that Rudolf Bultmann once said, um, uh, can't possibly believe in the resurrection of, of the dead. <laughs> so Bart um, would disagree with that and to say um, that in, in fact, these efforts of Schleiermacher et al to make the Christian gospel relevant are credible by building its, this, its uh, speech and practices you know, on uh, the scaffolding of whatever philosophical fashions are in the air, whatever kinds of, you know, theoretical discourses tend to be popping up at all the posh conferences, you know, that you uh, will undoubtedly attend, those of you who are going into the academy. The problem with that is that in the end, your interlocutors, the people you think you're writing for, the philosophers and the theorists and the painters and the writers, they don't care. They're just not interested in um, whatever that little kind of um, supplementary theological um, um, you know, uh, body of, of, of knowledge is that you're offering. You know, in in this project, and um, and it's um, it, it's a, another way of saying that um, that Christian evangelical theology, in the sense in which you know, it's the um, it's the churches, it's a, it's the it's dogmatics is, the, is a second order reflection on the church's distinctive practice um, does not need a prolegomena. You know, um, if you've read any German philosophy, you, 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 you will know that many of the great works of the German philosophical tradition, begin. <laughs> sometimes they don't ever even proceed beyond a prolegomena, like a, 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 um, an introductory preparatory kind of um, a lay, uh, the explication of the lay of the land, you know, of the cultural scene uh, within which, you know, you then place the Christian thought um, and hopes that it will somehow um, align in, 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 a, in a way with this kind of, um, you know, scaffolding or foundation or kind of epistemological grid um, and you know, find an audience, right? But Bart's like, you know, they don't really care at the end of the day. Um, so, and and then if, if, if I may, um, just the the the, um, the the reference to Goethe here, I honestly, I, I don't, I would love to know what Goethe's critique of Schleiermacher entailed. I, I, um, I have completely missed that passage over the years. Um, so, does anyone know? Like, does he, is this? I mean, is this? Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've read like some Goethe. I read his like travel diaries and you know some. some uh, what is that great sad boy novel? Um, that. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's the, the paradigmatic sad boy uh, novel of of the West. Um, but if, uh, if anyone can find that, um, not, not necessarily now, I'd be intrigued um, to know what his critique was. Um, but, but an issue here is, you know, what the, 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 the kind of vocabulary that Bart observes um, as the, the kind of um, preferred um, like universe of discourse of the 19th century Protestant liberals is romanticism. They're all kind of so hyped by romanticism, and uh, that 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 becomes kind of the 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 the, the um, really that fills in most of the kind of the content of these different examples that he gives here. 
Um, hey, um, do you mind if we keep talking about this together? But I'm going to need like another three or four minutes. But uh, is this okay that we do this? I mean, I'm having fun. But why don't, don't y'all just take uh, like a, uh, we're just going to take your regular like 10 minute break, okay? And then um, I'll, um, I'll walk around and uh, at, at the moment I don't feel anything in my right leg. So <laughs> I'll walk around and see if I can work on that. But thanks a lot, okay? We'll see you in a sec. Um, so um, let's, um, let me just say a few more words and then, um, and then if, if you don't mind, I, I just like to um, get your feedback on, on a couple of points. We could look up, um, back to page 23. Um, it's important to keep in mind um, that you know, Bart is mindful um, that there are um, numerous exceptions uh, to this kind of narrative he's constructing of Protestant liberal theology in the 19th century. Um, he speaks here um, directly on page 13 of, um, and I will read, um, well, actually, let's just, let's just begin with the sentence of, above, just to remind ourselves where we are in, in, in terms of, of his, um, of his, of Bart's analysis of this tradition. Finally, only a small realm remained for the genuine religious experience of the individual, All right? So theology turned into philosophy uh, of the history of religion in general. Theology turned into philosophy. Yeah, it's not a great translation. Theology turned into philosophy of the history of religion in general and of the Christian religion in particular. So theology kind of becomes you know, reduced to this kind of anthropological exploration of some kind of universal religious experience that goes by differing names and kind of differing religious traditions. And the Christian task is Christian is to explicate that common human universal category or, or capacity of religious experience in the context of its um, of its particular history, and, and again, the problem with this is not 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 that Bart hates philosophy. I mean, there's a story, one of his letters, in, in which he says that um, um, in the 1960s, when there were a lot, numerous Americans were, were going to Basel. Where about, where about taught Basel uh, in Switzerland to, to do their doctorates um, and, and others were, were coming to, to see and to visit the, this now hugely influential thinker, a Canadian theologian um, in, a, in a visit at, at his home, um, trying to kind of tease Bart out here on his critique of the 19th century and generally his um, his um, um, his his I mean at least ostensibly his disinterest in philosophy. I mean it's it's ridiculous. I mean Bart had read everything, and and was truly a genius on the level of you know name any of the other um, seminal minds of the of the early twentieth century. Um, um, uh, but um, but the, the question was you know uh, uh, Professor Bart. Um, you know, I'm I'm confused. Would you you know explain to me um, you know your i your 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 idea of uh, of philosophy and your theology? And he said, well, you know, I I read it and I use it when you know I find it helpful, but it's not um, um, it's not ultimately necessary uh, to the essential task of, of of Christian dogmatics. And so what? Um, what, what he's then sort of offering us here are, are like-minded dissidents, you know, to, to that liberal tradition. And he mentioned Johann Christian Blumhardt, Hermann Friedrich uh, Kohlbrugge, Wilhelm Luhe, and for the final years, the quite different Franz Overbeck. It's a very interesting character. Perhaps Johann Tobias Beck, never heard of him, and Adolf Schlatter should be included here. These outsiders fitted only partially. And then, yes, 
Kierkegaard, in particular, the great Danish um, a philosopher, sometimes kind of called them absurdly the melancholy, um, uh, a, a Swede whose really entire program was um, called into being as a um, as a um, literary, theological, rhetorical critique of Hegel and of the whole um, um, kind of aspiration, uh, generational aspiration to build these systems of thought, um, these kind of totalizing systems of of, of systematic knowledge that um, Kierkegaard rightly saw as um, both products of great human you know, hubris, intellectual hubris, but also as um, damaging and, and destructive and, and corrosive. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you get to figures like Buber and Levinas and some of the philosophers, philosophers of dialogue in the early part of the 20th century, you know, you're, you're, you're in that kind of tradition of Kierkegaard of, of people who are trying uh, and whose projects really largely involve the, the, the deconstruction of the Hegelian uh, and Kantian kind of architectonic. But Kierkegaard, and Kierkegaard's just wonderful writer, sometimes he's really perplexing and sometimes he's really maddening. Um, um, and yet, I, if I could just walk you into my office next door, my home, my home office here, I have like an entire one, like one row of shelf on one row, entire row, like of, of Kierkegaard. And it's not that I read it. I mean, I read it like every day and it's not that, um, though I try to read Kierkegaard kind of both as a scholar and maybe <laughs> devotionally, but it's just good seeing it there, you know? <laughs> it's just good knowing that, um, that he's, um, um, that that his 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 company um, is 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 uh, com comprises you know the, those those brother or sister travelers who have um, in different ways and different kinds of exemplifications even we'll see this in King and, and Zola um, deconstructed the 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 kind of totalizing projects of the 19th century um, figures. Um, and if I may make a further digression, there is a fabulous new biography of Kierkegaard um, that I love so much um, by, um, uh, what's her name, Claire, Claire, Claire Carlyle, who um, is a youngish theologian and in, in, in a British uh, who teaches at the University of London. It's called, I think it's called the Philosopher of the Heart just appeared last year with FSG. And um, Claire also wrote um, a really excellent book. It's like Kierkegaard for Beginners or something like that, uh, but it's not a great title. Um, that was part of the series. And then she did a, uh, an edition, a new edition of Spinoza's Ethics. But in any case, there's Kierkegaard um, who um, is, is saying that, you know, that what has been forgotten you know, in this project of the Protestant liberal um, pursuit of, you know, a systematic or encyclopedic kind of enclosure of all reality is individual particularity. It's those experiences that are idiosyncratic that cannot be, um, consumed you know into the whole into the system i mean it's 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 you know one of the ways we can even think about king and the civil rights movement is is you know is a, is a kind of emergent vocabulary that um that resists the you know this the, the system the, the the totalizing you know racial you know linguistic political um, um, regime. Um, so true, there was a more conservative element, which was tied more strictly to the Bible and the traditional elements of the church. There was also a more progressive element, and so on and so forth. And I want to get to the to the a passage on the next page that I think is um, 
it's a passage that's been perhaps over quoted and it may be one of those passages that have, that have made it easy to, to overlook Bart's kind of generosity here when he's thinking about the tradition, but it's a powerful passage. Um, and may I ask someone to read it? It's just a paragraph that begins, um, it may be much more difficult. It's a long paragraph, but be brave. Page two at the bottom. I'm sorry, page 15. Oh, y'all have a different edition. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a paragraph that begins, it may be much more difficult. I can do it. Thank you. It may be much more difficult to come to an agreement as the eclipse of this theology. The year 1900 brought the 19th century to its chronological end and mark at the same time a climax in the history of its theology. The publication of Harnack's What is Christianity? Due to this achievement, 19th century theology continued to live for some time with force and dignity almost unbroken, in spite signs of dissolution. This made possible a short-lived and partial renaissance of Schleiermacher around 1910. The actual end of the 19th century as the good old days came for theology as for everything else with the fateful year of 1914. Accidentally or not, a significant event <coughs> took place during that very year. Ernst Trolch, the well-known professor of systematic theology and the leader of the then most modern school, gave up his chair in theology for one in philosophy. One day in early August 1914 stands out in my personal memory as a black day. 93 German intellectuals impressed public opinion by their proclamation in support of the war policy of Wilhelm II and his counselors. Among these intellectuals, I discovered to my horror almost all of my theological teachers, whom I had greatly venerated. In despair over what this indicated about the signs of the time, I suddenly realized that I could not any longer follow either their ethics and dogmatics or their understanding of the Bible and of history. For me, at least, 19th century theology no longer held any future. For many, if not for most people, this theology did not become again what it had been once the waters of the flood descending upon us at that time had somewhat receded. Everything has its time. Evangelical theology in the true spirit and style of the 19th century continued to exist and some vestiges still remain. But in its former wholeness, it is a cause which today is significantly represented by only a few. This is not to say that we do not owe it our most serious attention for our own sake and for the sake of the future, but it remains true that the history of this theology had its beginnings, its various peaks, and then also its end. Thank you. Lovely, lovely reading. So let me pose the question, um, by the way, just briefly, the publication of Harnack's What is Christianity? Harnack, who was the great, um, uh, was a pillar of the great theology faculty at, at the University of Berlin, um, and a neighbor, by the way, of the Bonhoeffer family and the Berlin Grunewald, had written um, this book called What is Christianity? He was, um, it was widely known as, as the, the leading kind of historian of Christian uh, theology uh, of, of the day. And the, the, um, it's a fun book to read. And, and what, is, um, what is argued is that um, what is essentially Christian, uh, or, or the answer to the question, what is Christianity, is this. There's there's this thing that we can call the essence of Christianity. 
And that is its core defining, and in some respects, um, um, single, enduring, and you know, um, distinctive contribution to uh, the human um, uh, the human condition. And that essence is seen in people's responses in the gospel narratives to Jesus's summons um, to a new humanity or to you know uh, a, a, a new way of uh, understanding um, uh, human existence or a new way of thinking about um, about uh, the social and political order are um, more precisely in Harnack's view, it is, that is the essence of Christianity is the ecstatic joy, the experience of ecstatic joy that um, is captured uh, in the gospel narratives and of course in the Acts of the Apostles and then um, um, throughout, um, throughout some of the Pauline writings that, um, that was uh, with the development of the Christian religion, particularly after um, the fourth century and the period of you know, the um, early patristic fathers and the desert fathers and the like, the Constantinian you know, kind of turn, uh, um, gradually corrupted and forgotten. Okay, so it's this really quite dramatic kind of rise, uh, rise and fall um, uh, a narrative. Um, and um, uh, in any case, that's it's just a really interesting book that that Bonhoeffer liked and and kind of argued with. But um, the question at hand here is, what what is there about that certain bleak day in 1914, I'm going to ask this as a question or just something to consider, uh, that um, Bart reads here first and foremost as the result of a theological mistake, okay? What is, you know, put more simply, why um, does, does he so kind of you know, theatrically, if you will, um, um, offer his, you know, despair and his disillusionment and his sense that no longer could he stand in the tradition of the 19th century after observing 93 German intellectuals, including his own teachers in Berlin, um, a, a sign um, on their support of the war policy of Wilhelm II. What, what's theologically like? So, if this is if if this the purpose of this essay is to analyze and offer you know a kind of thick description of the Protestant liberal tradition. Here he's explaining why not only is it kind of um, based on you know a, a theological and unnecessary, not only is it, is it, um, it not only is it a um, betrayal, um, if you will, of the Christian gospel's sufficiency to um, unfold its meanings and its um, teachings and its, you know, um, its revelatory power and truth uh, through its own inner resources and you know through the, the, the through scripture and through the explication of scripture and through the practices of, of the church and all that. Why is it also historically a historically and politically dangerous project? Because that's kind of what he's building at here.
I can't uh, see if you want to. Uh, I can't really see your hand. So, um, all right, just start talking. <laughs> if you have any um, I, uh, anything you want to offer, I mean, I know you're all just writing such great stuff. Um, but what is what's the what is what is the and, and so what, first of all, the, the, um, I tell you, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn briefly to Bergen. Do y'all have to, uh, uh, Doris Bergen's writing in front of you? Um, I'd like to just look at um, the first, well, this is just like the first two pages of her um, introduction. Did you read, I'm sorry, did you read the section one like one people, one church, exclamation mark, the German Christians? Yes, okay. So um, let's tell me if you have that in front of you. You got have that in front of you? Yes. Yeah, so let's begin um, with this passage. Um, no, let's just begin in the beginning, okay? Um, National Socialism, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer once remarked, brought an end to the church in Germany. I mean, that's sort of what Bart is, is, is claiming here. And, we know Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer's own kind of intellectual affinity to the Protestant liberal tradition was um, uh, shaken at its foundations by his discovery of, of Bart and his reading of a, an early book uh, of, of Bart called, um, what's been translated as the word of God and the word of man, but I think the, it's, uh, this word, it's, it's like just the, the um, um, uh, the Word of God and the Task of Theology, I think is may, maybe a better translation. For Bonhoeffer, one of the few Protestant clergymen who took an active role in plans to overthrow the Nazi regime, national socialist ideology and Christianity were profoundly incompatible. Most Christians in Germany did not share that conviction. And so what, what Bergen is beginning to um, lay out here is basically is essentially what Bart uh, is is um, what 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 Bart uh, has concluded um, uh, about the political and 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 historical implications are um, at least possible you know kind of applications of the um, Protestant liberal tradition uh, that he, offers on page 14. Most Christians um, um, did not share that consideration. And this group, uh, this book is about a group of people who disagreed with both Bonhoeffer and Hitler. Adherents of the German Christian movement, uh, the uh, Glaubensbewegung Deutsche Christian, uh, Deutsche Christen, most of them Protestant lay people and clergy, regarded the Nazi revolution began in 1933 as a golden opportunity for Christianity. National Socialism and Christianity, the German Christian movement preached, were not only reconcilable, but mutually reinforcing. Along with other Protestants, members of the group expected the National Socialist regime to inspire spiritual awakening and bring the church to what they considered its rightful place at the heart of German society and culture. I mean, it, it became, um, to me, um, even more menacing in this story of, um, of how Christianity became ingredient in you know, the architecture of the Third Reich to discover um, that most of these you know, good, dutiful, officious, church-going German lay people um, referenced here and described in some detail in the book, in fact, welcomed Hitler and the Reich um, not only as uh, a, a means of um, overcoming, you know, the, the, the so-called shame of Versailles, right? You know, and this um, this kind of enduring. Um, shame that the international world had placed upon them as being the sole um, 
cause of the First World War and the construction of this massive kind of persecution complex that um, the Germans developed. But indeed, moreover, as revival, like as a revival of the Christian gospel. I mean, the, the churches were not particularly, church numbers had dropped, right? Um, um, well, I never didn't go to church and really have that much interest in it and, and, until um, uh, some events that we'll look at after a while. He was baptized and, you know, he, he learned the catechism. But, um, but the ascent of Hitler to power uh, also brought a, 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 like a renewal in the churches. Like people were getting excited about um, going to church again, and 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 now um, they were driven by um, this idea that you know, not only was there this new kind of um, transformation of the German nation in view of all of its enemies globally and persecutors. But there was a, um, as, 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 as some of the um, um, early Nazi theologians would um, allow, <laughs> there was um, an opportunity to complete the work of Martin Luther. And, uh, and what was meant by that was to develop a distinctively German Christian religion, a, 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 a gospel that was shaped um, by the greatness and the essential holiness of the German nation, its history, and its destiny. And if that sounds familiar in some respects to doctrines of American exceptionalism, then you're thinking in the right direction here. Um, and um, so uh, certainly, uh, and so the, this, this, this term, the German Christians, don't be mis misled, the German Christians uh, was in fact a, a, the majority of, of Protestants in the German church were, um, um, were those who sought to um, bring the um, aspirations of this new triumphal, um, uh, you know, Reich that, um, that 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 Hitler promised into um, a congenial relationship with Christian religion, with scripture, and with the kind of the the the, the, the biblical. Um, um, narrative as, 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 as it kind of was woven into kind of this um, um, story of, you know, um, neo-pagan kind of Teutonic ideals about, you know, Germ Germany as the apotheosis of, you know, human greatness and this sort of then this sense of, of the German genius as as in fact a, a kind of messianic um, summons. This is all part of what Bart is kind of alluding to in this comment that he makes um, on page 14. Can we, can we just keep continue reading just for a minute in Bergen? The German Christians, as, 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 as adherents of the movement, called themselves in the 1930s uh, and 40s, were not unique in their willingness to combine Christianity with other beliefs and traditions. The history of Christianity uh, could be seen as a series of such accommodations and mergers involving groups as divergent as the Roman imperial elites and the indigenous peoples of the Americas. But the Nazis unconcealed murderous schemes and antagonism toward Christianity might make the attempt to fuse Christian tradition with national socialism, the most improbable combination of all, producing a refiguration barely recognizable as Christian. Advocates of the cause called that outcome German Christianity. So the German Christians were German Protestants who remained and sought to remain within the structures of the German state church, the Lutheran church, who wanted to make the Nazi ideology 
palatable to people in the pews so they could recognize it as Christian, okay? And that was an exciting, you know, um, uh, tease, an exciting promise. Given the logical and theological contradictions that made up the German Christian movement, it is easy to conclude that it had little influence, indeed, much of the standard literature on the churches in the Third Reich, the scouts that German Christians as marginal, et cetera. The evidence, however, tells a different story, and this is the evidence that, um, that uh, Bergen so brilliantly marshals um, out, of the, out of obscure archives in Germany in her own research to tell the story. Despite their precarious location between the disapproval of some fellow Protestants on the one hand and the annoyance of the Nazi leadership on the other, the German Christians maintained a significant presence throughout the years of the National Socialist rule. For more than a decade, they sustained a mass movement of over half a million members with branches in all parts of Germany. Adherents held important positions within Protestant church governments at every level and occupied influential posts in theological faculties and religious training institutes. Indeed, by you know, the end of 1934, all theological departments in uh, Germany um, had to um, have um, undergone this process of, of, of assimilation um, that is accommodation to the right. And so routinely, um, crucifixes were replayed, replaced with spot stickers and um, uh, such research institutes were launched. I mean, these are these are research institutes launched by some of the most, most brilliant kind of uh, linguistic minds in the world, um, as the one um, launched in a town called Eisenach. Um, and and the, and, the, and the historian um, 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 Susanna, uh, Susanna Heschel, the daughter of actually Rabbi Abraham Heschel, who We'll see. Was Dr. one of Dr. King's friends, Susanna Heschel, teaches at um, Dartmouth, uh, wrote an amazing book called *The Aryan Aryan Christ* that Princeton published some years ago. That I also highly recommend. And uh, *The Aryan Christ* is a study of this institute that was founded by the universities and the state church in the town of Eisenach, in a castle where Luther had, you know, translated. I can't remember whether it was uh, done as Romans or or, or as Crin or as um, or, or Galatians, but anyway, um, and it 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 brought and through you know its vast financial resources together um, these leading groups of of uh, biblical scholars and linguists and theologians for the purpose of eradicating from Christianity, all elements of Judaism. I mean, it was literally called, I mean, can't, I can't re just remember the name off the top of my head, but it was called something like the Institute for the Eradication of Judaism from Christianity. That's, uh, that's not the precise name, but it's something along those lines. And so the movement's quest to, to fuse Christianity and national socialism reflected the desire of many Christians to retain their religious traditions while supporting the Nazi fatherland. Throughout the 1930s and during the war years, German Christian women and men held rallies, attended church services and published newspapers, books and tracts. They sang hymns to Jesus, but also to Hitler. They denounced their rivals as disloyal and un-German. They fought for control of local church facilities. Through sermon speeches and songs, they propagated anti-Jewish Christianity and boosted national racial polity, policy. After the Third Reich collapsed, instead of being ostracized in their congregations and shut out of ecclesial posts, German Christians, lay and clergy found it relatively easy to reintegrate into Protestant um, church life. And this is one of the things I think is just so interesting about Dorte Zula as well as um, Jürgen Moltmann's wife, who's often lost in all the hoopla around Jürgen, who I love and he's a friend, uh, Elizabeth, um, who, who both um, began their theological studies in German universities like in 1945 and 46, you know, and uh, in both in their memoirs, they, they write about this truly surreal kind of um, moment 
when, you know, after the, the decimation of the universities in this sort of sense that um, at the very least, the theological faculties would um, have um, been, um, would have would have removed through some kind of process of denazification that existed in, in the larger political order, those theologians and biblical scholars who took part in this, you know, perverse and catastrophic effort of um, deracinating Christianity from, you know, the Judaism from uh, from the project uh, who who pursued the project of, you know, promoting such uh, perverse notions as you know the, the disinheritance theory, which you know was really the kind of building block on which the German Christian movement was was based. And in some respects, it was anticipated that certain bleak day in August 1914 that Bart mentions um, 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 of of um, of um, the the, dis, the disinheritance the disinheritance theory, which promoted the idea that in Jesus Christ God disinherited Israel of their ancient covenant as um, God's elect, and so the election of the Jews um, uh, that um, we um, read and fund which, of course, historic Christianity is based. And the Hebrew Bible, which of course Christian, you know, the historic Christian um, teaching and truth claims um, are based, um, has all been annulled and canceled. And so, um, what you know, what 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 begins to um, emerge then is 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 something that may may be in some ways familiar to, you know, um, some prevailing, you know, theological projects in the North American scene, this attempt to, um, you know, baptize the uh, German nation, you know, in the, in the sort of the, the shallow waters of, of some kind of um, exceptionalist um, narrative. So here's the passage. The passage goes like this. Um, and this is really what's at the heart of um, that, uh, of, of answering that question. What, what are, so how, how, can, how can this tradition of German martial theology um, that Bonhoeffer is raised, reared in? I mean, you, you'll read next week passages in Sanctorum Communio which is a brilliant book. It's a book that Bart admired. It's got so much um, uh, to, uh, to offer us and our you know, explorations of, 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 this, um, of these thematics. But you'll notice like in a couple of footnotes, he will give voice to this, these ideas that, you know, um, to kill an enemy in the name of you know, the German nation um, is to um, um, be understood within you know, the, the, the Christian preaching of our day um, as um, um, a justifiable act and cannot be identified with murder and has no kind of um, bearing on the ethical teachings of Jesus. And this will obviously change very much, but he's getting bur burst of um, voice to what's called the German martial tradition, which is the kind of fusion of, you know, German greatness, German destiny, uh, of course, the martial, the military, the manly, the muscular aspirations for domination and control and all of that. And, um, and the uh, the Christian religion, and Bart says that the the the, the basic problem, the fundamental problem, both here in fourteen and then you know later in thirty three, is that um, the, the the theologians, um, the Protestant theologians of, of the nineteenth century, began to speak um, of um, God by speaking of humanity 
in a loud voice. All right. And maybe maybe I'm, I'm just like thinking that it comes from another essay in the humanity of God. But that's really like the heart of the of the of the of the thing, the matter here. Um, begin, uh, the, the project of of beginning to speak about God by speaking of humanity and a loud voice, that is speaking about God, not on the basis of the God who comes to us through Israel and Jesus and through this far country of the triune God that is always and in every way um, different, sorry, um, different, uh, fundamentally different than, than our own nation, our own situation, our own tribe, our own class, our own, you know, kind of uh, scene um, um, that um, beginning to speak about God by speaking of humanity in a loud voice um, uh, um, is, creates a kind of methodological um, habit or framework within which you can then and will then substitute humanity with the whole constellation of your own tribal national prejudices and preferences. So speaking of God by speaking of whiteness in a loud voice, speaking of God by speaking of Germanness in a loud voice, speaking of God by speaking of the American project and a loud voice and just fill in the blank. And so he's reading, and I think this is like, why does, the, why does live theology need to exist as a discipline? Because we, we, we want to understand um, what, the, you know, we want to understand, first of all, the social and political consequences of theological convictions, right? And we also want to understand how certain um, methodological shifts can, and often do, according to Bart, create a framework that is ripe for the construction of idolatry. And if I could end with one wonderful um, memory of my own years here as a student at UVA, um, a lecture by uh, Rabbi Emil Fackenheim, who's a Holocaust survivor and a really important a philosopher um, um, and historian of Judaism, um, who um, gave one of the distinguished lectures here um, one year. And I mean, the topic uh, you know, was, was sort of uh, around um, his most recent book. And um, uh, there's a Q and A after um, he had finished, and an undergraduate um, stepped uh, briskly to the uh, microphone. And I, 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 I love teaching doctoral students. And I love teaching graduate students. I love teaching undergrads, and and I especially love the way that um, um, many undergrads um, lack the inhibitions that I often carried around as kind of an insecure graduate student. I didn't want to speak unless it was like thought this out and formulated. It's going to sound really bright. And the thing is, you often get like the most interesting responses. If you ask like just really direct, simple questions, questions you may even think are dumb because they're not. And she said, Rabbi Feigenheim, um, this is one question. What does it mean to be a Jew? <laughs> and people are like kind of, kind of, and then with just utter seriousness, he says, uh, to be a Jew means to wage war against the idols. <laughs> and that's really the heart of what is the subversive kind of power of Bart's project. And that lack of attention to and discernment of and categories of discerning the idols um, is what Bart sees um, and um, uh, as um, the, the, the most costly consequence of this legacy of Protestant, Protestant theology in the, in the 19th century. 
hey, I did not plan to go two and a half hours with y'all, but I'm, I'm thrilled. And apologies to Professor um, <laughs> Aiken, um, whose uh, discussion periods I'm sure are far superior to my own, but um, uh, I am, um, I, I'm grateful for your time and uh, grateful um, for just being able to read such amazing things with you. So, peace. I do want to tell you real quickly that Sanctorum Communio is written as a doctoral dissertation. It's going to be tedious at times. Don't worry. You're not going to understand some of the stuff. Don't worry. Just plow through. I still don't understand a bunch of the stuff. You'll be fine. Okay. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.